so I'll just take a few minutes uh, to talk about Thales, the mathematician, and um, why he was given the title of sage, and also um, what benefits uh, in history did he get from getting this title as sage? Because you know, one thing that the ancients did tend to do was that now that they have decided that there are these seven sages, and Thales is you know one of the great sages, you know he's like really really respected. Now, uh, they would attribute all kinds of inventions to him. Because, you know, okay, this is an ancient invention. We don't know where, whom he came from, uh, whom this came from. So um, let's sort of attribute it to Thales because he was a great sage, you know. And, and this, this tendency to attribute to, you know, one philosopher, and it might have come from a number of them, but to, to one philosopher, you know, all kinds of inventions and all kinds of discoveries. So, because we don't really have extant proof, really, you know. So one of the earliest people, even the eclipse, was mentioned by Herodotus, who lived 150 years after Thales. So um, we don't really have uh, extant sources from Thales' time uh, for, uh, you know, the things that he um, purportedly invented and did. We have, um, we have a lot of testimonia. Uh, and that's what we'll be looking at, you know, from Aristotle, from Theophrastus. Um, but we, we will not be sort of, you know, we don't have original sources. But let's talk about, uh, you know, you, um, those of you doing mathematics might have heard of Thales' theorem, but I'm not going to go into the specifics of that. But let's talk about the kind of uh, mathematical sort of discoveries he is supposed to have made. So we know uh, that... I mean, we don't know, but we assume that he introduced uh, geometry to Greece. And this geometry, we assume that he probably became acquainted with in his travels to Egypt, right? So the idea is that he must have traveled to Egypt and then uh, looked at the pyramids. And there's one source which talks about, you know, the shadows of the pyramids. Let me just see if I can read out that thing to you. Uh, so... Because he has some fairly interesting, yeah. <clears throat> um, so this is from Diogenes Laertes. Uh, Hieronymus says that he, that is Thales, actually measured the pyramids by their shadow, having observed the time when our own shadow is equal to our height, right? So this, this is you know one of the inventions that he supposedly did by going traveling to Egypt. Uh, Eudemus. This is from Proclus. Um, Eudemus in the history of geometry refers this theorem to Thales um, for the method by which they say he demonstrated the distance of ships out at sea must, he says, have entailed the use of this theorem. Right? So again, uh, another sort of invention now, this time by looking at ships. Um, there might be more, but okay, anyway. So I'll give you a list of um, the kind of um, theorems he's supposed to have invented or found. Um, so he was specifically credited with these theorems. One, that a circle is bisected by its diameter. Second, that the angles at the base of an isosceles triangle are equal. Yeah. Um, third, that if two straight lines intersect, um, the opposite angles are equal. Uh, fourth, that the angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. And fifth, uh, that a triangle is determined um, if its base and the angles relative to the base are given. So I'm not going to go into all the details of these theorems, in any case, you know, uh, mathematical work. Uh, the mathematicians amongst you can maybe help in one of the interactive sessions. Um, so he's, what, what we will look at is the fact that he's one of the first person to whom mathematical theorems are attributed. But when we call them theorems, they're not theorems in the modern sense. In fact, uh, Euclid uh, would be a, a closer mathematician. So you could, you could think of uh, Thales as having discovered them in some way, but not, not left any proper proofs. And uh, Euclid as having you know, then tried to give a proof. But then a proof is a very historical thing. A proof for Euclid is not a proof for a modern mathematician. And uh, so, so the idea of the proof itself, you know, is, is historical. It is something that, that changes, uh, you know. So, so the proof that, for example, uh, Thales would have given, so uh, observing the pyramid and the shadow and the angle, um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not something that is recognized as a proof. It's, it's more like you don't really need a very great knowledge of geometry, I, I assume, to, to uh, sort of figure that out. And, um, 
So the proof given you know, by uh, Thales would be different from a proof given by Euclid and would be different from a proof given by a modern mathematician. Um, so uh, he, these mathematical theorems are attributed to him, and which means either you know, it, it, maybe it is true that you know, he did discover them, or people contemporary to him might have discovered, and um, it's attributed to him. In, in either case, uh, he, what we do see is that he started employing an approach which is inclined towards the theoretical rather than the empirical, right? So rather, if, if we think of you know, um, the Greeks, uh, the, sorry, the Egyptians as being these geniuses who uh, you know, had such an amazing knowledge of geometry that they managed to make these pyramids perfectly, which still survive, you know, you can go look at them. Uh, and um, they, they managed to make, uh, you know, they, they managed to make these amazing roads. You know? like the, the knowledge of geometry is unparalleled, really, you know, they're geniuses. But the theoretical approach we are getting from Greece, right, the, mathema the mathematics, the mathematical theorem. So the knowledge of mathematics is already there in, you know, uh, Egypt and Mesopotamia and Babylonia, uh, sorry, Babylonia is the same. So, so from all these places, but um, from what we are getting now from Greece is a kind of theoretical approach, a, a mathematical approach, which means a turn towards abstraction, right? rather than towards practicality. Um, the idea that we can now extract universal laws from particular instances, from, from, you know, from matter, really. A kind of generalization in which, if you think about it, instead of thinking of you know, particular sort of shapes which would make the pyramid and you know, how we would fit them, um, what, what you see here with these theorems is that you know, um, they are starting to think of um, Triangles in themselves, or circles in themselves, you know, that the diameter bisects a circle into two or something, or the, the, um, in an isosceles triangle, it's of equal angles, or, or, or whatever. You know, so, so all these theorems, you know, like the, you're, they're thinking of the form of the triangle, not about this particular triangle or that particular triangle. It's not that, you know, they're thinking that in this particular triangle, you know, this is, this, these are the things I observe. So it's not an immediate observation of that triangle, but an observation of triangles in general. It's not a particular sort of observation of this circle, but an uh, observation of circles in general, which means that, you know, they're moving from um, just looking at material reality, confused reality, to trying to think about form, the form of things, the structure of things. <coughs> and so they're, what they're attempting to do is that they're attempting to find a sort of, you know, a, a simplification of reality via abstraction. And that's what abstraction really does, you know? So it, it sort of uh, introduces a kind of unity, a kind of tidiness to reality. And, and this, this sort of tidiness comes from a rational understanding, a rational basis for understanding reality uh, is what sort of gives us this tidiness in the first place. And in our interactive session, maybe we could look at one of the texts which talks about how Thales could have in the first place predicted the eclipse. But I'll just read out the section before we end the session in which, uh, this is from Herodotus, in which he says, in the sixth year of the war, which they, uh, Medes and Lydians, had carried out with equal fortunes, an engagement took place in which it turned out that when the battle was in progress, the day suddenly became night. This alteration of the day, Thales, the Milesian, foretold to the Ionians, uh, setting a, as its limit this year in which the change actually occurred. Yeah. Now, it's not that, you know, eclipses were something entirely unknown at that time. You know, people had observed them. And in fact, I think that there was a Sumerian calendar in which, you know, uh, people could at least predict the year of the eclipse. And if you see in Herodotus, he also says the year of the eclipse, not the precise eclipse. Um, so uh, the idea is that um, the prediction of, um, of, of an eclipse, which comes from a level of abstraction of thought in which uh, what, what Thales is to, uh, credit to, credited to have done is that he could predict, you know, uh, with a certain degree of precision that, you know, this eclipse would happen. And why was it even noticed? It was noticed because during the war, you know, and the war is an important business, um, it went from day to night. And this sort of, you know, was like a big thing. And they're like, oh, yeah, this fellow from Ionia had predicted it. So uh, this, this idea of 
um, understanding the world, understanding natural phenomena from a level of abstraction um, is, is what you know, uh, Thales is credited to have done and is what gives him the title of a sopos or a sage. Thank you. <laughs>